City on Fire. Um, I'm just using this as an example of one thing. There's a, a fairly lengthy section here that's been cut. Yes. I had a whole chase going. Yeah, this is, this is part of the chase. Um, uh, I, I wanted, uh, well, actually it comes from something else. Hal got worried that the audience had nobody to, quote, root for in Sweeney Todd. So he wanted to make Joanna and Anthony the people the audience would identify with. So they were chased, and then they, then I devised a chase afterwards. And I think, I don't, I don't know if you've come across it, a chase through the cellars when Sweeney is after them with a razor. And um, I said to him, you know, if, if people aren't rooting for Sweeney, then there's no show. But I wrote this extended chase, anyway, for City on Fire. And Hal did stage it. This was actually in at least the first preview, where they, uh, they ran across the bridge. You know, there was a bridge that mm -hmm. came down. And um, uh, so that's what this is, but I haven't but seen it. But it makes scene. her less of a heroine. I mean, it makes her more ditzy and... Well, I still have that one line where she says, uh, you, you said you'd marry me Sunday, that was last August. I still got that. See, I think the, the interesting thing about the plotting to me that, that Chris Bond did is that she's the one who shoots, the, that Antony's too tenderhearted to shoot Jonas Fogg. So she said, oh, come on, let's get out of here. I, I have enough of this. And she takes the gun and she shoots him. So the fact that Joanna, I love that idea of a heroine, that she's ditzy, but she's capable of killing people. It struck me as, you know, a really swell idea. And um, so that's th this, uh, let's see, this is... Uh, uh, Oh, this is a, 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 an echo of Kiss Me, sung by Joanna. Which uh, is very funny. Yeah. I, I guess the, the larger question that I'm asking is, to what degree can people looking at your manuscripts use cut material to inform their characters? Oh, fine if, if they want to study it. I just don't put it in the show. There's very good reason we've cut everything. I, every time I've ever cut anything from a show, there's a good reason. I... There's, n there's nothing I would ever, I wouldn't want to restore this, uh, even, if, even if I believed in the chase. I mean, um, uh, I can't stand when people restore stuff and want to restore stuff, you know. There's a very good song in night music called Silly People, sung by Frid the Servant. And the reason we cut it, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it says what the show's about, and it's a, I, I'm, I like the song a lot, but it's a character you don't care about at that point in the show. And of course, I get requests quite often from companies, can we restore this song? Partly because it gives another, the actor who plays this tiny part a chance to sing, and because it's a pretty song, and it seems relevant, but no. And so, uh, uh, when a score is published, one of the reasons that we have never, George Firth and I, until recently, namely last year, never allowed Merrily We Alone to be published, was that we were not satisfied with it then because of Jim Lapine's production in uh, in 85 and then our subsequent changes not very many because that was the big change uh, and but finally we combined two scenes into one and we did it in Leicester in England we looked at each other and said okay that's the best we could do this is good now this is what we want it to be and then we allowed it to be published the same thing is true when I publish a vocal score it means all right I'm willing to let this go in for posterity which is why I insisted that the judge's song be in the vocal score, because I wanted it for the future. It's in the appendix where it becomes uh, 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 optional, but I wanted it printed, meaning if you want to do the song, here it is. But I, and I may even put, I don't remember whether, I think I put the tooth pulling sequence in mm -hmm. there too. Mm -hmm. Again, but it says optional. Um, uh, whereas this is not in the vocal score because it's not. It's but there have, Marry Me a Little is back in recent productions of Company. Right, and, and, and so we've been talking about the rep, uh, reprinting of the vocal score, about reprinting. Cause it, so I you think feel good about that? Yes, that yeah, I think, I think Company is better with Marry Me a Little at the end of the first act and no TikTok dance in the second act. I think it's better, so I would love to re, republish that. The Two Follies. Oh, I know, I prefer the first one. And there's going to be a big production out of Paper Mill this <laughs> spring, and it's the original. There's some changes in the script, but it's the original score. How would you feel about the original, but Abbott underneath instead of Lucy and Jesse, or nothing like that? Leave it the way it was meant to Leave be. I, all that stuff was compromised. I, 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 musicals, this will sound terribly kind of self-serving and modest, but 
you, you write a show with your collaborators. I didn't want to change Follies. I always liked Follies. I liked the book of Follies better than Jim Goldman did, and so did Hal. He, Jim was the one. Cameron McIntosh and Jim Goldman wanted to change it for London and make it more real and less surreal and have it blah, 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 and all kinds of changes. I didn't want to do it, but I, I think it's unfair to stamp your foot when somebody offers you another production and say, no, no, I won't let you try something new. Who knew? It might have turned out better. It didn't. And when it didn't, I said, I don't want this show ever shown in America. And I made it legal that, that that version can never be shown here. And I, I don't want it shown in England either, but Cameron had, has the right to do it. But Cameron is given in now, too, and there was just a production in Leicester uh, last year, and it's the original. And in the new night music, they've put in the yep, gla other yep. glamorous life and yep. some... Yeah, that, that's for England. No, I, no, I don't want to change that. It, it was okay. perfectly okay, but I prefer the original. Okay. Um, one of the things in Sweeney, um, there's a cut section of By the Sea where um, Todd has a counterline, oh. God, the woman's mad, this is very bad, anything you say. Oh. And it occurred to me, I, I assume you cut it because you didn't want it there, and that's fine, but an actor playing Todd who looked at that would say, at this point in the show, Todd is just agreeing to agree, but he really thinks this woman is mad. Right, right. And should he think, can well, he look at your... No, but he can, and but you know better. that's in the stage direction. It's very clear that Todd okay. is completely distracted, and I mean, the whole point of the song is Mrs. Lovett is trying to, to wake him up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very clear that's what she's doing, and it's a guy who's got to be distracted, and he said, because it's still, there are little shards of that left in, not sung, but right. spoken, where he says, yeah, anything you say, anything you say, actually, it's sung. Uh, and that, that's enough, that's all. I, originally, I was going to make that a, a full-blooded duet, and then I thought, no, the idea is when you're brooding, you don't talk. You think, and you brood, and you're sullen, and you're glum, and you're glowering, and she's trying to make you cheerful, and you don't want to rock the boat and say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And that's, that's, that's the way the scene should be. It calls for silence. Um, just a couple of questions about Sweeney in general. Um, one of the things that surprised me is it's such a huge score, and yet there's much less sketch material proportionally than there is in the other shows. It was such an easy show to write, I can't tell you. I just, it just wrote, as Barbara Stuyson would say, like butter. <laughs> it's the only problem I had with Sweeney. Uh, the, f f the first 20 minutes, the first seven songs, right up to Pirelli, I just had a good time because I was writing a horror movie, and that's what I love, and one of the things I love. Then I, I, I the, the Pirelli sequence was a little more difficult. I remember there was a sort of a jog in my mind. Oh, I know what it was. The show, I was, I was afraid, was going to get too long. When I started, there was no Hugh Wheeler. It was just me and, and the Christopher Bond text. And then I realized Christopher Bond's entire play is 35 pages long in, in acting form. And I was only uh, up to page five, and the show was 20 minutes, minutes long. So, uh, no, it was, I'm sorry, I was up to page three, and the show was 20 minutes long. Something like that. The point was, it was going to turn out to be the ring if I didn't cut it down. And I got, I, got, I, got, I, I, I got panicky. I wish I hadn't. I wish I'd stuck to my lens and just done it myself. But um, I couldn't, and so I, Hugh had written... Uh, murder mysteries under a pseudonym for a long time, and also we'd worked together very happily. And so, and he was British, and he under, he you know he knew what Sweeney Todd was as a legend and all that. So, and I'm very glad because he made, he made some changes that are very important and very good for the show. Uh, but it was at that point that the show became not quite so easy to write because I got worried about length. Then with Hugh aboard, I felt confident, and then it was, it was fine until I got to the epiphany or to that moment, because in, in Bond's script, it's the one weak moment. I never believed why Sweeney would turn from frustration at an individual killing to wanting to kill the human race. And in Bond's script, he literally just says, I have tasted blood. I'm, I may paraphrase, but it's about tasting blood, and I want more. That's all said, and I thought, boy, in something as operatically melodramatic as this, that's not enough. Hugh wanted to make it a religious turn. He wanted to bring in a whole religious thing. And I said, no, let me think about it. And so it took me a month to write the epiphany. And uh, ordinarily, I, a song of that length takes me, if I'm writing at my top speed, about two weeks. But the real problem was to find what is it that turns him, exactly what it is. Working that out was difficult. 
otherwise, and from then on, I remember, how how always used to complain, and, and, and I think with, with justification, that I wrote so much at the last minute, I have this reputation of incomplete scores. They're not that incomplete, uh, night music accepted, and there are reasons for that. But the fact is that I do tend, as the deadline approaches, to write more and more. So the director doesn't get a chance, and the choreographer, to digest the material, you know. And Hal had never really made that clear, that I was uh, hobbling him by shoving him three songs in the last two weeks, because he doesn't get a chance to think about what he wants to do with them. Hal recognized my rhythm on this, and so even though we went into rehearsal without the final scene, without the, really without the last... 15 minutes, I said, I'm sorry, but I, he said, I'm not worried, it's fine, I know where I'm going, I know where you're going, it's no problem. The show wrote that easily, it just seemed, seemed right. So the answer is, this was an easy show to write. A quote from you, a little priest is going to be too fast forever and ever, and it's my fault for not slowing it down, and that's on the TV film version. Mm. I don't the know TV you, film version? The, the one that was videotaped for PBS. I, I, I assume that's what you were referring to. It might when, have been the when you, say, when you say show, I'm sorry, you're talking about, you're talking about, the, the, oh, you mean, oh, you mean you, okay, you're talking about the taped, the, the road company that was taped. Okay, right. Sorry, I thought you meant the TV show. Well, I okay. think that's what you were referring okay, right. to. Um, oh, well, no, it was, no, uh, I don't know, uh, I, that's what I was referring to. It is conducted too fast. There are aspects of the conducting uh, that I didn't pay enough attention to when we were out there uh, taping the show. And um, we didn't have an awful lot of time because the budget constraints uh, uh, were terrible. And so I let go by this too fast thing. On records, it's different. On records, uh, Goddard Lieberson, the father of the, the show album, said, you know, generally on records you have to speed things up because the, there's no, no eye interest as there is on the stage. And Lenny, I remember because I was in charge of the West Side Story recording, because Lenny was away conducting. And when he came back, he was shocked at the tempi of West Side Story because many of them are much faster than they were on the stage. But they're exactly right for the listener. How much work do you do on the recordings? How do you prepare for them? A lot. I, it, when you have a record producer, you sit around with a record producer and determine what are you going to cut. And things like this, what transitional material you're going to cut, and are you going to include any dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's the most important thing to do, is to determine what is the shape of the, of the recording. Do you determine specific new timings? I mean, do you sit with a metronome and say, okay, for the recording, no, we'll do No, the do producer will come to me and say, okay, look, we, here, the total score is 84 minutes. We've got to cut seven. Okay. Um... This is perhaps, I, I don't know what it means, but it, I noticed great similarities in Not While I'm Around and No One Is Alone, just sort of stylistically, you know, the Uncoded. use of the seconds and, and all of that. I'm just, they're, they're sort of similar lullaby type things, trying to calm mm. children or whatever, and I'm just, true. True. you know, any thoughts about that? or no. No, uh, the, the, the thing that makes them different is what's going on in the bass. The, the, the no one is low, mm, ba-dum, 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 as opposed to mm, num, mm, num, mm, num, in Not While I'm Around. Otherwise, no, they, they are similar. In that. Uh, one of the things I notice here is that the melodic line is four-eighths and then a half note, and four-eighths and then two, two quarters, although one is on the downbeat and one's on the third beat. But still, um, no, they're... they're Actually, when you come to think of it, you've just said it, the function dramatically is similar, isn't it? It's, a, it's an older person calming a younger person. So, I mean, do you, but the use of seconds, for instance, do you think of that as being a, a huh. calming thing? No, or no, just a, no. I, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of suspensions, and rather than use thirds, I'll always use a second and then resolve it. Okay. Um, I think the last thing about Sweeney... Um, for the London production, um, you wrote a letter to Declan, and you wrote, I'm working on an accompaniment to wait that will be a little less Sergio Mendes. And, and here's... <laughs> I, 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 always, I always fall into South American rhythms. I don't know why. In every, every, every show, and quite often songs, just in the, whether they're 
relevant or not, and I just thought, well, what is South American rhythms doing in the middle of, of Victorian England? And um, but I couldn't, so I, I I made another, I made something with less ba dum ba dum. Actually, the um, there's an influence uh, in, in uh, weight. The chord structure is influenced by a South American lullaby that I know. And, um, um, and Can you say what it is? Yeah, it's, it's Mansal Lotke's uh, uh, a Lullaby to a Negro Baby. And um, it's, it's, it, I, I first used those chords. I stole them from him for um, Don't Look at Me in Follies. It's in there at one point. And then I used them here. And I'm afraid that the rhythmic idea crept in while I was asleep, while I wasn't noticing. And it's always bothering me. This also, this is the song that's least satisfactory in, uh, in Sweeney, and it's not because of me and Montalake, it's because I wasn't able to find the proper expression of, uh, the, the, again, you talk about lullabies. This is Mrs. Lovett trying to calm a completely berserk person. He's not younger, but it's a lullaby. It's how do you calm somebody down who's having a hysterical fit, although his hysterical fit is he's jumping up every time the doorbell rings and grabbing his razor. And she doesn't want him going berserk, waiting for this guy to come. And so he can kill him. And um, so I, I didn't, it's not the right song. And if the movie goes ahead, I'm going to find something else for this. I, I you know, this will be on tape, and maybe we'll go ahead, and it'll be the same damn song. But I would like to find something else. I'd like to find a way of expressing it. This was another song, another scene that I intended to rewrite. I think I covered this mm -hmm. one in the last couple of days. You know, where maybe it should be a duet. Maybe it's he says something rash, and then she calms him down. He says something. Else. Of course, that's going to be the same rhythm as the Epiphany, which is coming up, where it's you know, rash and then calm and rash and then calm. Maybe I can make capital out of that. It didn't occur to me until just this minute. Maybe there's a way of echoing that, 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 that the changes he goes through in the epiphany are the changes he goes through, in the, or that they go through in this song. But something's got to be done. Anyway, any rate, what this is, is an attempt to take out the South Americanness of it. Uh, although I notice I've still got the dotted rhythm in the bass, but... Um, if one does do this song, is this the accompaniment you'd prefer them using? Oh, uh, I'd have to hear it again. Probably, but I don't know how I would do that now with the, with the score published uh, the way it is. I don't know. I don't know. Also, when this was reorchestrated for London, in this version, it's for a nine-piece band, so it's, it's impractical. I, I, one of my favorite memories from the original production was, and I, I don't know that it has any significance, but when Angela did, um, now goes quickly, see, now it's past was never had I seen time so concretely expressed. I saw that moment. Mark, it was Mark, that's why I love you, because you're the only person who got it. And that, that moment, it justified the song for me. And it, I don't think anybody but you ever got that moment. You're the first person. And that, for me, justified it. And when I realized that nobody was getting it, I thought, it's not. It doesn't well, work. But for that, me, thank you. Thank, yeah. thanks, thanks, thanks for noticing, because I thought that was a terrific moment. Pacific Overtures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same period. Different country. Different country. Um, actually, this is on your in your lyric sketches for the opening number, the advantages of being. Um, yeah, that's what it was originally <laughs> called. Um, I just noticed this little thing, and it fascinated me. And you wrote, "Him to order," and then in parentheses, "Nature,", nature. and well, as as a continuum, as opposites. No, as, as a continuum. I mean, the, the you know Japanese haiku so often deal with things like plum blossoms and the moon through the willows and stuff like that. And they're almost Oscar Hammerstein poems now that come to mind, and. Um, the order of nature is is basic to Japanese philosophy. It's you know nature tells you what to do, and um, and nature is the overriding spirit of everything. It's what what is it? natural. It is because it isn't just pretty flowers. It's the 
It's order. It's order. And there lie, as you know, the old Japanese structure, at least until the last 40 years, has been order. It's all about order. And, and it's the orderliness of, uh, that they get from nature. And, um, you know, the passing of the seasons is key to the way they think. And I tried to cover that in the lyric in the opening number. How would this help you in the writing of that number? That uh, no, it's just to keep... I, 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 when I start a lyric sketch, uh, as you can tell from all these, these little sketches here, it's, uh, you get the philosophy of the number. Now, in this case, it's the philosophy of the country because that's what I'm trying to set up in the opening number. But uh, I often start uh, 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 my lyrics with just making a list, free association, of what the song is about. Not necessarily the point of it, but the atmosphere of it and what it's dealing with. Here I'm trying to, in one song, establish for an audience that's un completely unfamiliar with the culture, an entire culture, not just the culture that they may know from uh, anti-Japanese movies of the war, but the culture that existed in 1852 when things were in order before chaos arrived in 1853. The West. Right. So the idea here is to paint a picture like a Japanese screen that is completely calming, or a Japanese rock garden. If I were doing this as a movie, I would show it a Japanese rock garden first, because that's the ultimate of simplicity and order in nature, made, but how man adapts that and makes a kind of tranquil art out of it, but also a way of living, a way of life. And I happen to admire it, too. Uh, I wish I could have it. Before you started this show, were you aware of Japanese culture? Or no, no, not really, not really. I, I was brought up on movies, and so I thought the, the Japanese were uh, a lot of little people with, with buck teeth and glasses who tortured Americans. And um, uh, it, uh, it was Weidman being a, a, a Sinophile, uh, and having written this play, introduced me in that sense to Japanese culture, although it's not, he's more interested in, so I think, the socio-political aspect of it. It wasn't until uh, I went over to Japan with Hal for a couple of weeks and saw it for myself, not that it was in any way an epiphany, but just to be there and see the ladies with obis in the department stores and see the contrast between what was and what they Because, you know, you see a Japanese woman in an obi buying Chanel, in a department store, it's something very weird and very, and you think, oh, I see, this is a show about discombobulation. And we try to do that with an image at the end where, you know, next, the, the big contemporary number with all the sort of vaguely rock music and it occurs, and in the middle of it comes in from a hundred years ago, the fisherman and his wife, I mean, the, the, the samurai and his wife. Um, it's, uh, I was trying to capture that in this. The whole point of an opening number is to not only lay out the ground rules for the audience, but tell them where they are, you know. And um, just like Oklahoma did famously, the shot that was heard around the world. When Curly comes on singing that solo, and you see, you know, a, a, a woman with a butter churn and a, 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 a cyclorama with a windmill on it, and, um, uh, you know, and, and plains and nothing else, a prairie, you know where you are. You know you're not in New York. and. Um, same thing is true here. So it seemed to me that the thing to, uh, to emphasize, I probably was actually thinking of singing a hymn, probably. Uh, but uh, I, I, when I put something on a yellow sheet up in the right-hand corner, that is usually the key idea. These are lists of ways to carry it out when I just start f filling stuff out on, on, on the yellow pad, where I always write on line paper. And up in the upper right-hand corner, if I'm writing a song particularly, it's keep this in mind. This is what the song's about. Don't lose sight of this. And it never changes. Well, sometimes it does, of course. But it, this, uh, we're talking about the initial impulse. This is probably the first yellow sheet I wrote for Pacific Overtures is this particular sheet. And up there, it's about the Except open. for Pacific Overtures, this is the second version of the opening number. The, the, the oh, you mean the prayers? What, we, no, oh, no, oh, the advantages? Well, it's just, was, yeah, but oh, well, the advantages and uh, uh, it, it, they're essentially the same number with a different lyric, you know. Okay. Uh, the, the original, Hal didn't, for some reason, took, I happen to love the line, uh, the advantages of, uh, the advantages of floating, I can't remember the, the adjective, 
bunk in the middle of the sea. Some advantages of, no, it's not floating. The advantages of being set in the middle of the sea. Some advantages of being set in the middle of the sea. Kings are burning somewhere. And he missed the sentence structure. I mean those as paragraph headings. Some advantages of being set in the middle mm -hmm. of the sea. Colin! And he couldn't accept that. So I had to change it. And I changed it to, in the middle of the world, we float in the middle of the sea. And so it now has a statement to make. It's the same song. But um, uh, it's interesting that the, uh, I was going to make something of the four. There are four islands and four floating cherry blossoms. I mean, I was, uh, floating was always in this, but all right, that's what happened. I still prefer advantages, but that's one of those compromises. Right? A technical little thing. Um, just the horizontal lines that you have here, do you know what they mean? Um, oh, those are stress marks. That's all. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bomb, bomb, bomb. It's just stress. Simple. Yep. And by the way, that was poems. Oh, right. Someone in a tree. Mm. Nothing in particular here, but the you've talked before about writing. There's very little that happens harmonically in that number until the so-called chorus. Until the chorus. Yeah. And well, I think you know what I'm about to ask. So. Well, go ahead, ask. Um, how you sustain interest with that kind of relentless... What I did was what is done, what I discovered about Japanese art, I discovered what I you know, finally caught on to, which is they're the ultimate uh, culture in less is more. They are the minimalist culture. You look at a Japanese screen, you know, I went up and looked at the, the exhibition uh, fortuitously at the Met of Japanese screens, and uh, or Japanese art, I should say, and I remember stepping out of the elevator or up at the top of the staircase, wherever the hell it was, and there was a three-panel screen. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. First panel was absolutely blank. Second panel was absolutely blank, except for the end of a bird's tail. And the third panel had the rest of the bird in a tree. I thought, I can't believe it. Two blank panels and a third, and it's a three-panel screen. Click. You know, I thought, oh. It's all about less is more. So I wanted to echo musically the whole cultural idea of less is more, meaning we're just going to take this one chord, and by making tiny little variations on it, we're going to gradually build it up and sustain it so that the audience never gets bored, but it's 60 bars of one chord. But the rhythm keeps changing, and the texture keeps changing, and where the chord keeps getting placed just changes a little bit at a time, maybe every four bars, every eight bars. It is not insignificant that when I met Steve Reich, he told me how much he loved this show. It's not, it's not just because he had a lot of trend, but it's similar because, you know, so much of his music is influenced by Oriental music, which is influenced by Oriental art, and so it's all part of the same cycle, isn't it? And that's what the verse of Someone in a Tree is. It's minimalist music. Nothing's going on, but everything's going on. It's phase music in a very, very, very simplified form, of course. His, his version of all that stuff is far more sophisticated, but, um, but it is the same thing. It's the same thing. And it works very well, because when you finally settle down to the chorus and it finally hits the tonic chord, there's that sense of and you, it's, it's really, it's, I think it's terrific. So that's what that is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt musically to echo the visual and the literal of Japanese art. Because again, what do you think haiku are about? It's called, How Simple Can You Make a Poem? Simple. Simple meaning less. Less is more. You know, think of, think of shogi screens. Think of tatami. You know, there's only one size for a tatami mat. Only one size. You just got to make your floor out of that size. You make any kind of domino setup you want. One size. But within that, infinite variations. Well, depending on how you place them. But six by three is six by three. <laughs> 